Amen. Good morning, church. Um, I provided for you kind of a message outline as well as um, some of the scripture verses that we'll be referencing apart from our main text today. If you need a copy of that notes, there's also space there. You can write your own notes. Just raise your hand real quick and maybe the ushers will run that out to you if you need some notes for this morning. Also, we recognize there's on this side here, raise your hand high so I can see you. Um, also, we recognize that we have our children with us worshiping God together, and we do that intentionally. We want them to worship with family, learn to pray, learn to worship through the hearing of the word. We also provided you special notes uh, and a set of crayons and, and a pencil. Uh, there's clipboards over there, and you can kind of draw what you're hearing, and then maybe take it home and talk to mom and dad about what you heard, and they can help kind of talk that through with you and process that. So if you need any of that stuff, if you have cakeys with you and they want notes to kind of sketch um, during the message time, just raise your hand for that too, or just go and get it right there at the resource table, okay? Here we go. So welcome back. We're back in the Gospel of Mark. We've been, I think, taking a break for almost a couple of months, two months almost, so we are back. Turn to Mark chapter 10 and kind of just keep your spot there. The Christian life begins with reconciliation to God through and in Christ. So that's that vertical uh, relationship that is reconciled, right? And last week, uh, Micah, our pastoral intern, spoke of this idea, the union with Christ, the good news that by God's grace, he unites us spiritually to his son by his spirit so that when we believe, church, the good news is that everything that Jesus obtained in my union with Christ belongs to me, comes to me. The righteousness he earned through his perfectly righteous life is mine. The death he died in my place for my sins on the cross is given to me. He pays my penalty. I'm adopted as his child, right, as a son of God through Christ, my new covenant leader or, or head. Eternal life through the resurrection belongs to me, all in his love, all by his grace, all for his glory. When I'm united to Christ, this is my reality by faith, and that's good news. And so we rejoice because Christ has reconciled us to God. That's the gospel for all who will believe. But as we grow upward in our relationship with God, we learn about him more. We learn to love him more and what that looks like and what that means. We are also to grow in a horizontal kind of dimension as well. Jesus leads us out to love others in his name, discipleship is both vertical and horizontal. Here we are, we're returning back to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Jesus continued to set his face to the cross where he would restore sinners by grace to God. And along the way, as we're going to see here, he continues to teach his disciples what it means to also love others, how to treat others in his name how to live under his kingdom, the horizontal dimension of discipleship to the vertical. So growing in love, church, for God should lead us to grow in love for others. Love for God, church, and love for others is inseparable. And I hope we see that. Uh, 1 John 4, 7 to 8, I think I put that in your notes. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And so here we are, Mark 10. In this large section, verses 1 through 45, Jesus prepares his disciples for his departure by teaching them about discipleship in right relationship to God and men. Horizontal and vertical. So we're going to kind of embark in a new mini-series in Mark Discipleship in relationship, okay? This next big section, discipleship in relationship. For the next several weeks, we're going to consider different kinds of relationships and what it means to follow Christ in them. We're going to look at marriage, children, relationships to those who are rich or high status, leaders, relationships to those who are the little or the least of these, as they're called in the scriptures. Today, we're going to Look at the section containing Jesus' teaching on marriage and divorce. So we're jumping back into Mark, and here we are. <laughs> Heavy one. This is where we happen to be. So go ahead and look at Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 12. Yay, we're back in Mark. 
Mark chapter 10, verse 112. Uh, the scripture should be on the screen there for you. Please follow along. This is God's word. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again. And again, as it was his custom, he taught them. And the Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This is God's word this morning. We recognize that marriage is a constant and crucial topic of concern in all ages, especially today, as our culture tries to destroy this God-created marriage, right, with divorce becoming kind of a common practice, with the really blasphemous redefinition of marriage as being between the same sex. But here's the thing, marriage has always been a hot topic. It's always been an important subject because it's important to the God who created it. He created it. It belongs to him in the beginning. You remember in the beginning, it was Satan who first sought to divide the first husband and the first wife and also to separate them from God. Satan attacked both that horizontal and um, um, vertical and horizontal dimension. And while we recognize, church, that marriage is critically important for the church, it does not make the challenge of marriage in a sinful, fallen, broken world, any easier, does it? Add to this the temptation to adopt the casual attitude and practices of our culture towards divorce and towards marriage. Marriage is under threat. And it was in Jesus' day, too. That's what we're going to look at today. Church, I want to say this as well. It's not just the bad marriages that need the saving. All marriages need a savior. Because every marriage needs Jesus. And what we see in our passage today is that the Son of God proclaimed the truth, sought to bring his disciples back to God's original intention for marriage. As he, the Son of God, was standing before his disciples as the Savior and the true meaning of marriage. So the big idea today is Jesus restores marriage. Very simple. And three headings for you today, and it should be in your notes. The challenge against marriage, the truth about marriage, and the warning concerning divorce and remarriage. Our objective today is to see that Jesus, it's Jesus, and only Jesus, who restores marriage. And so we recognize the challenges and look to Christ. We hear the truth from him. We know the truth found in Christ. And then we heed his warnings about divorce, and as his disciples Submit to Christ. Well, let's pray. Let's ask God for his help as we consider what his word has to teach us today. Father, we recognize that you use hard words to create soft hearts. That you love those that you speak these things to. And so, God, we ask that you would help us because we confess that we fall short of the way that you think we fall short of the way that you desire for us to, to live. We fall short in our marriages. We struggle with the brokenness of marriage in the past or even in the present. We deal with divorce in present or in past. God, I want to thank you that you recognize that we're just mere dust. That in your kindness, you sent your son to redeem the broken, to restore sinners to yourself, to even restore 
marriage is as you intend. So help us, God, to know, to believe, and to obey your word today in Jesus' name. The church said, yes. Number one, the challenge against marriage. Starting in verse one, we see several serious challenges. Uh, Jesus resumed his public teaching ministry, right? He's headed to Jerusalem, headed to the cross. Verse two, again, we see the Pharisees. They come to, we're specifically told, test Jesus. And they do that with this question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, first, I want you to know this, that word test, it comes up four times in Mark, only four. The very first time we already considered, and the very first time it's used, is used of Satan, the enemy. You remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and Satan came to him, he tested him, he tempted him. Here's what you need to know. Satan hates, seeks to destroy the Son of God. He hates Jesus. And because he cannot destroy the Son of God, Jesus Christ right, won the victory. He lived, he died, he rose because Satan can do nothing. Satan vents his hatred at God's image bearers, people. And so Satan also seeks to destroy marriage. That's what he does. Marriage was created by God to reflect his glory. It was created for the good of his image bearers, that we would flourish. Church, we need to recognize the first challenge is a spiritual one. The enemy hates it. The enemy hates your marriage. He especially hates marriages in Christ. We need to be aware of this challenge. Vigilant, prayerful, okay? So that's the point. The Pharisees were acting like the devil himself. Seeking to destroy Jesus, destroy marriage. Second, their uh, attempt to test Jesus is, is very sneaky and very important. You remember uh, John the Baptist, Jesus' forerunner. You know, he was recently, uh, in Mark 6, executed. Um, he spoke against the king, Herod, and his unlawful divorce and remarriage to his brother's wife, Herodias, you see what is happening here. The Pharisees sought to test Jesus, make him say something that would get him killed, like John. It was a hot topic in the day. There was a lot of threat to that. Again, the Pharisees were acting like the devil himself, seeking to destroy the Son of God, seeking to twist marriage and use it in a way that is opposed to God. Okay, that's what I want you to see. But masterfully, right, what does Jesus do? Look at verse 3. He points them to the Bible right, to the Old Testament scripture, specifically the law of Moses, the first five books. What did Moses command you? That's a good impulse, church. We should learn to uh, react that way, to think that way when we're faced with challenges. In any case, it seems like Jesus specifically used the word command here. Notice, what did Moses command you? Because he knew, just as well as the Pharisees who do their Bibles well, that Moses, that God, did not command Divorce. He phrased it that way to force those Pharisees to acknowledge this important distinction here between God's word and what it allows, right, in order to protect victims, in order to prevent rampant sin, and what God's word commands, demands, requires. And so that's what happens. The Pharisees are forced to admit, look at verse 4, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Now they're Answer wasn't invented out of thin air. They are basing this kind of answer from Deuteronomy 24.1, um, which is printed in your notes, and, and um, it's an example of something like a case law. Okay, it's an application of God's moral law to a specific situation. Let, let me read it. When a man takes a wife and marries her, so you hear that, that specific scenario. If then... She finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. And there's this debate at the time about that word, what that constitutes. More on that in a bit. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. She departs out of his house. Now, in this example, we're never meant to merely consider, okay, what does the law say? And let's just kind of get up to that. And, you know, or what doesn't it allow? And let's just get as close to that as possible and just kind of stop there. No, we're always, church, meant to consider what is God's ultimate intention with his law, with his word. What is 
his ultimate intention for his people and for his glory. What's, put it like this, what is God's heart in what he's saying? We, we tend to play these games, right, with the rules of God and see what we can kind of get away with or get close enough to. Is this legal? Is that right? But they weren't getting it. It's about the heart. And we know this because look at verse 5. Jesus explains. He explains why Moses allowed for divorce because of your hardness of heart. He wrote you this commandment. And remember, commandment in this sense is that allowed will of God, the permitting course of action. He, he wasn't saying, this is what you are to do. Thou shalt get divorced. <laughs> he was saying, this is what you are to do in this situation. Okay, but why? Why would Moses allow divorce? Jesus said, it's because of your hard heartedness. That phrase is one single word in the Greek. It describes a numbness toward God because of constant and repeated sin and rebellion against his command, or put it this way, against his heart. That's what hard-heartedness is. It's when our hearts get so hardened towards God's heart, it's like we can no longer hear its beat or feel its warmth anymore. It's that thing that happens to a heart when it's void of God's love, void of God's compassion, and so that person can even treat their own spouse with deadly coldness. That's hard-heartedness. And it's as though God, in this precept that he's giving, in his mercy through that commandment, is saying, stop this. They've become so cold, so hard-hearted in their sin, in their rebellion, so unloving, even to their own covenant spouse, so here's what you must do to prevent the devastation and the sin from being unchecked. According to Deuteronomy 24.1, that's what God was seeking to do. The, the man was made to follow a proper legal process. You know, he, he had to obtain a bill of divorce. He had to legally have it drawn up, formally witnessed, right? Formally presented. The law was meant to bring accountability to hard hearts. It was meant to bring a measure of protection for the victims. But here's the problem, church. It could not solve the heart problem. Law can serve to protect but law cannot change the heart. And we need new hearts. Church, here's my point. Marriage is still under fire today as it was in Jesus' day. Satan still hates God's son and hates God's people. He still wreaks havoc on God's image bearers. He still attacks marriage. But one of the greatest challenges that we still face in marriage today is the sin of our own hearts. See, Satan in the world can whisper lies, but it only appeals to our selfishness and our own pride. Hurt, unforgiveness can cause us to lose sight, lose a sense of God's heart for our marriage. And we can begin to turn from working for God, working for our marriage, and instead focus on making the marriage work for me. Because God wants me to be happy, right? And so the heart can begin to turn away from God and dangerously become hardened toward God and toward our spouse. Here's what you need to know, church. There are tremendous challenges against marriage, and we cannot save ourselves. We can't. We need a Savior, and good news is Jesus, whom we proclaim, is that Savior. Here's the thing, he doesn't promise to save your marriage, per se. But he does promise to save you from your wicked, sinful heart. Listen to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christ died and rose again so that we could be forgiven and receive new hearts by faith in him. So that we begin to know his heart again. 
hearts can beat with his, feel his warmth, and perhaps have his heart for our spouse. And you can begin to see Christ today. And there's a lot more to be said, right, about preventing hard-heartedness towards God and towards your spouse. There's a lot more that needs to be considered to help us. Maybe you're struggling right now through real challenges in marriage, but what good is it to gain the perfect marriage and lose your soul? And every dealing, church, with challenges at the heart level starts with coming to Christ because he's the savior of our hearts. Okay, I'm going to move on. That's my first point. There are real challenges that we must recognize so that we're driven to Christ. But second, Christ came so that we may also know the truth that will set us free and give us freedom in our marriages. Now, before we get into this second heading, I want to give you parents here a heads up quickly. I'm going to be talking about marriage and sex just a bit. I'm going to speak mindfully of the fact that we invite and have our children present. I'm going to be respectful of you parents. Um, I also provided kind of three articles on the resource table over there um, that will help Christian parents have this conversation with their own children. I'll just say this before I get to my second point. Parents, you need to consider now how you're going to have that conversation with your children, those conversations with your children, especially because we live in a world where they're beating us to that conversation. Parents, you're called to protect your children in the truth. We want to help you with that. So if, if that's you, um, as you go out, you can grab a couple of those articles that will hopefully help us have those really important conversations with our children. Okay, heading number two, the truth about marriage. Go ahead and look at verse six. Jesus, the son of God, continues to pronounce God's divine ideal, right? His heart for marriage, the truth about marriage. So he moves the conversation from that mere kind of legal provisions of the law. Look at verse 6, and he takes the Pharisees where? Back to God's original intention. To the beginning of creation, he refers to Genesis 1:27, when in the image of God, he, God, created them male and female. Now, this is wonderful side note for the Christians. Uh, the Bible helps us clearly, explicitly solve this whole current debate about gender. God made them male and female, period. It's not interchangeable or fluid. Okay, this is according to his good design and for human flourishing and for his glory. So helpful. Okay, back in here. And the reason why Jesus goes there, right, brings up God's creation of these two sexes is that the differentiation of the sexes, male and female, is the basis for the union of marriage. So look at verses 7 and 8. Jesus quotes from Genesis again, Genesis 2.24, therefore, right? So he made the male and female, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then Jesus adds emphasis, right? Repeats it again, highlights, so they are no longer two but one. The result of the marriage covenant, right? That promise-based relationship is that God creates a single indivisible unit. And that one flesh union, the, the sexual union, completes that covenant. So this is something that God does, right? And then that union is the consummation or the completion of that covenant on earth, right? Between the husband and the wife. So here's the big idea. Jesus is just straightforward. In marriage, God makes the two one, now, in verse 9, we have this main point. Um, Bible scholars consider this whole passage as a uh, pronouncement story. It was a form of storytelling to kind of drive a single point home, right? So if you were to walk away from this story, uh, you would get that one point. So what is the pronouncement that you're supposed to remember? Mark 10, 9 is where we have the main takeaway. What God, therefore, has joined together, let not man separate. That's the pronouncement for the church. The phrase joined together, it describes this uh, literally being yoked together, right? You have the, that cross piece made out of wood that's attached to the two animals that pull a cart or a plow. The image is that God's the one who brings them together, the man and the woman, for his work, right? For his purposes, for his kingdom, if you want to put it that way. And man must not 
destroy that union or hinder God's work. As one commentator put it, I think that's in your notes, divine action shall not be canceled by human action. Disciples of Jesus must not divorce. That's the pronouncement. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, church, here's what you need to know. Because Jesus points back all the way to God's original intention, right, in making one man, one woman, one in marriage, that's what he calls his disciples to uphold, not to seek to separate what he joined. We're called to uphold that. Marriage is God's creation, and we're called to stand with that without compromise. Now, I'll say this to be sure, when sin does happen, because we do live in a fallen world, we must always, church, always deal with one another graciously, do what we can to seek to minimize the devastation of sin. You know, our church is called not just to say, okay, don't get divorced. We're called to help. We're called to guide. We're called to protect, to pray for one another, to help struggling marriages. You know, I'm praying that our church is a place where people can feel safe enough to talk about that. I'm, I remember sitting across a brother who, was, who had been at our church for a long time, and this was the first time that we sat at this table and he told me how terrible things were going. And I thought, why now? When things are just so far damaged, did he not have anyone else to talk to? I'm praying that our church will have this culture of safety where we can say, I'm struggling, that we'll have a culture of accountability, that our, our church will aim, you know, with, with church discipline, that's the aim, is that people won't be abused, that it'll prevent us from getting to hard-heartedness that leads to divorce. Okay, but disciples of Jesus, hearing the voice of Jesus must never give up hope. We must never compromise Christ's word in seeking to separate what God joined so beautifully. Um, this past Friday, Aiden Higa, one of our awesome deacons, handles the sound ministry. He got married to Sarah Maldonado, who now Higa, um, our dear sister, church member. And I, as I talked to people this morning, they just kind of reflect on the how beautiful the day was and family and people coming to witness uh, Sarah and to take this great step in the covenant of marriage, right, and celebrate the wedding. But what was most beautiful about it was what God did that day, right? He was the one who was making two one. He was the one creating a new family for his kingdom, and he was the one declaring his own love once again, through the parable of marriage. Because that's what marriage is, church. It's not merely a human act or in institution. It testifies to the gospel. According to Christ, it's something that the triune God has done. That Jesus, sent by the Father, came as the faithful husband, the faithful lover, and laid down his life for his bride, the church, to save her. Church, that's you. That's the gospel. That's what was proclaimed every marriage. It testifies. And what all Jesus is saying here is that we must not seek to de-beautify what the Trinity has made beautiful. We must not desecrate what the Lord deems sacred, not separate what God has joined. So we come to our last heading. With such a high truth, a high reality, comes also a warning, right? Right? protecting this truth, this reality, and we come to Christ's warning about marriage and about divorce. So, number three, the warning. In verse 10, um, his disciples ask Jesus in private, right, in the house, it says, for a little bit more help to handle this truth, a little more clarity on his teaching. And in verse 11, Jesus, 11 and 12, Jesus makes two kind of parallel statements about divorce and remarriage. Uh, the first addresses a man who divorces his wife and marries another. And that man in remarrying actually commits adultery against the wife he divorced. 
The, the second statement is kind of just like it. It addresses a woman who divorces her husband, which in that culture, in the Jewish culture, that was not very common, but you remember Rome was also in governance, and in Roman culture of that day, that was pretty common. If she marries another and she commits adultery against the, um, the husband that she divorced. And Jesus is teaching at face value is just really straightforward, isn't it? Very radical in his day, just as it might be to your ears today. Um, marriage after divorce equals adultery. That's what it seems to say. The d- divorce and remarriage, which would have been commonplace in Jesus' day, is seen as an offense against God. You gotta remember that. It wasn't any better in Jesus' day. When they heard that, it was hard. Uh, Matthew 19, verses 10 to 11 is kind of the parallel account of this same event. It gives us a little bit more of, of the sense of the disciples' response to what Jesus says. The disciples said to him, and I have this in your notes, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Right? They're so shocked. They're like, wow, everybody should just never marry. <laughs> but Jesus said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. Here's what you need to know, church. As we consider this, and this is kind of the hard section, so bear with me. As we consider this, there are good students of the Bible that disagree, disagree on Jesus' exact meaning here. Uh, let's, let's take a look at that. The question seems to be, is he talking about no remarriage after unlawful divorce? Or is he talking about no remarriage after any divorce, lawful or not? You, you guys see the difference there? Now, I'm not going to be able to get into all that needs to be. People have wrote, written books and books about this. Uh, I printed out some helpful articles on the resource table there. If you want to know more, kind of dig into more and hear more of the views and more in depth, uh, grab one of those articles. Or I think there's three different ones there. Um, disclaimer, I don't agree with all this stuff on there, but I find them very helpful to understand the different understandings of this passage. So I'm going to mention two. It's kind of two more common views for us this morning. Okay, so... Let's start with the agreement. All agree that divorce and remarriage are not, according to Jesus, the ideal, right? But the question is, is divorce and remarriage ever permitted? That's the main question, and that's where these two views kind of diverge. So let's take a look. The first view, some believe that remarriage following any, any divorce is prohibited by God. Uh, they look at passages like 1 Corinthians 7, Romans 7, 3. I put those in your notes. You, you should look at them later and make your conclusion. And I can't get into it while I appreciate the integrity of that view, the, the commitment to Scripture in that view. I do not hold that view. Um, I don't tend to land there. Uh, in, a, in another commonly held view, others believe that remarriage following lawful divorce frees a person to, to remarry in the Lord. So if the divorce is lawful, then that gives you the freedom that permits a person to remarry in Christ. Again, Staying married, just want to make this clear, staying married is always the ideal, right? And to be clear again, divorce is never commanded in the scriptures. But in this view, I believe the Bible permits divorce and remarriage in cases such as, you know, sexual sin and adultery. Um, um, Appealing to Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, those should be in your notes. Or abuse, right? Ephesians 5 or abandonment. 1 Corinthians 7, and it's permitted only after all efforts not to divorce, right, to stay together, all those efforts have been exhausted, and only after proper uh, church discipline is administered. You can look at Matthew 18 for that clear process. Okay, this, this is the view that I lean towards. Um, New Testament scholar Tom Schreiner calls this the classic Protestant view because it seems to be the majority view. But we should always be open to what the scriptures actually teach, church. And, and I need to study more, and I'm open to be convinced otherwise, but this is my view. Um, I would also add that I agree with uh, Paul Carter. He's a pastor. He wrote this, and the quote is in your um, notes there. It says this, and this is important. Hard hearts cause people to persist in sin, and hard hearts make it hard to forgive others. But becoming a Christian is about getting a new heart, a soft heart filled with the Holy Spirit. Such a heart is capable of change in the direction of Jesus Christ and is capable of forgiving a brother or a sister or even the most, of even the most grievous sin. Therefore, 
there really is no reason for two legitimately born again Christians to ever get divorced. By the grace of God, they can change and they can forgive. I think that's important. I think that's true. Again, good, godly Christians with high views of the Bible differ on this issue. But I want to be honest and set forth two of the more common ones. It's a very important issue, but listen, I need to say this. It needs to be sorted out carefully, kindly, right? Biblically, no compromise, but in the context of a local church. And we got to also be careful not to condemn one another. Okay, don't take this teaching and look on others and condemn them or unnecessarily try to divide on all this stuff. Um, Our church, to be clear, has no official church position on this because we seek to take each case with as much grace and truth and wisdom and love as possible, relying on the Spirit of God to work in us. Okay, before we close this up, let me just draw some implications here. However, church, when you consider what the scriptures are saying, what Jesus himself is saying, you know, this strong warning and what it's saying for disciples not to divorce, we should heed the warning. We should slow down. We should take this very seriously. For the born-again believer, we don't even want to come close, right? We don't want to come close to separating what God has joined. We don't want to come close to making de-beautified what God has made beautiful. We don't want to come close to committing adultery. Church, because Jesus loves us, he issues this strong warning. So here's the question, boil it down. Will you submit to Christ? Disciples of Jesus must. Plain and simple. We must. Now here's the good news. Those who are in Christ have this promise, okay? That they are and will forever be God's people. No matter what. On top of that, they have this promise that God himself commits to write his law. Okay, take that as his heart, right? His original intention and write that on our hearts by the Spirit. Jeremiah 31, 33. That's what it means to be born again. That's the good news. Through Jesus, we can be born again. New hearts, we can truly desire to submit to Jesus. Even when it's hard, whatever it entails, even unto death, because Jesus submitted unto death for us. We see the grace of God to us in Jesus, and we trust that grace to uphold us in the truth, and we trust that grace to forgive us of our sin in the past, and to redeem us of our sin in the present, and to redeem our future for his glory. We believe in Jesus. He's the hope for hopeless sinners like me, like you. And I came across this article written by a Christian who went through a divorce, and it was heartbreaking. It, I could barely finish it, yet it holds forth gospel hope in such a beautiful way. I, I put the quote in your notes. He wrote, once the divorce was finalized, I hated hearing, now you see it was for the best. You're both much happier, and the kids are resilient anyway. I will never agree. The gospel demands us to hold two hard truths at the same time. Sin is terrible and deserves punishment. Yet God can and will use sin for his glory and the good of those who love him. I would not wish divorce upon my worst enemies. I have also experienced the truth that God is sovereign over divorce. He's sustaining me, showing me more of himself and making me more like Jesus through it. I hate so many of the repercussions of our divorce, yet I'm also learning how to say with the psalmist, it is good for me that I was afflicted, so that I might learn your statutes. Psalm 119, verse 71. Let me wrap it up like this. The challenge to marriage is real. And in his kindness, God gives us grace to meet the challenge. He reveals through Christ the truth of his design for marriage that we might pursue righteousness. May we, church, take that word about divorce, about marriage, seriously. 
and take care not to abandon it. Instead, may we rely on him to be our savior, the savior of our lives and, Lord willing, the savior of our marriages. Church, Jesus is the faithful husband that every marriage is meant to point to. He loves his sinful yet redeemed bride, the church. He laid down his life for that bride that we might be holy. May we humbly receive the word that he has given us today. Amen? Would you please stand if you're able as we close in response with singing? And let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are rich in mercy, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Gracious Father, have mercy on us, we pray. Glorious Son, our Lord Jesus, we thank you for being truth incarnate, for not only revealing truth, but being truth, being the Savior, being the center of our lives in faith. Have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, empower your church today to walk in a manner that is pleasing to you, to walk by faith. Have mercy on us. Your church prays all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.